I'm Andrew Natsios. I'm the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service here at Texas A&M, and I'm also a professor in the Bush School. Uh, we decided to hold this event this evening because of the growing concern in the United States and in the news media about the coronavirus. COVID-19 is the official acronym for it. And we have at the table three scientists who are going to do the technical part of it. I will talk about what the Scowcroft Institute's been doing for the past five or six years, six years now, actually, uh, about it. But the three scientists are first Dr. Christy Blackburn, who is an assistant research scientist at the Scowcroft Institute. She has written our three policy papers, which you can get online. Uh, they're right here. I, I have just to show you what they look like. Uh, you can get them on the Scowcroft Institute website. We also established a separate platform within the, the uh, library system called CIDIP. What does that stand for? Scowcroft um, Infectious Disease Information Platform. Scowcroft Infectious Disease Information, information Platform. Platform. And it's a, a, uh, a platform to put information. We have blogs by prominent scientists around the country. And uh, our publications, these papers, we also have shorter papers. And we'll have updates as things go on in terms of the, um, the outbreak. So we set this up five or six years ago because I wanted to focus on uh, issues which are not being discussed elsewhere. And when I saw General Scowcroft, who was one of our great national security advisors, he was President Bush 41's national security advisor, I, I was a little nervous. He's a hard realist. And I said, Brent, I mean, I, I want to tell you what we'd like to do. And he said, Andrew, you can do whatever you want. I, I appreciate you telling me. And I told him that we're going to focus on one of the major issues is on pandemics. And he said, why didn't I think of that? I said, so you think it's a good idea? I think it's an excellent idea because no one's talking about it. This was five, six years ago. And we have issued three policy papers. We have an annual summit of scientists and policymakers and academics from around the country, in fact, around the world. We've had, we had the, one of the senior people from the Chinese CDC come and speak two years ago, and a prominent Nigerian uh, scientist speak uh, last year, twice, yeah. in the past year. Uh, and he, is, he wants us to hold one of these in Africa, so we're gonna do that eventually. Uh, we issue a policy paper based on the input from the people that speak at these conferences. Uh, and then we have a a conference in Washington that's very public uh, at the National Press Club. And we had one last May, and I'll tell you what happened. C-SPAN covered it. Now, C-SPAN doesn't have hundreds of millions of viewers, but people do view it. And it so happens that we had Senator Burr speak. Senator Burr and Ted Kennedy, when he was still alive, co-sponsored the Pandemics and All Hazards Act which gives authority of the federal government to act in the case of a pandemic. So what we're facing now, all the authorities for the federal government are from that act. It has to be renewed every certain number of years, and it was languishing in committee for six months. It has nothing to do with the act. They weren't gonna renew it as a hostage to something else. Well, they, congressional staffers watched the C-SPAN. They didn't actually come, they watched the C-SPAN event. It was reported out two days later of committee. And this explanation was, you scared us all to death. We did not want that bill sticking in this committee just in case a pandemic took place, which of course we do now have. Or we don't have it yet, but we probably will have it. So our conference had an effect. It actually moved a piece of legislation through the process that gives authority to the federal government to act in the, in, in the emergency that probably is going to come our way shortly. The second uh, instance of influence is in September of 2018, uh, September of 2018, President Trump signed the uh, executive order on biosecurity and uh, natural hazards. Uh, it's national biodefense strategy. National biodefense strategy. And Dr. Blackburn was reading it, and she noticed that a number of the <laughs> sentences in it were directly taken out of our first or second policy paper. And she said, well, they didn't they didn't put a footnote down, and, and they, they didn't give us any credit. I said, Christy, <laughs> this is a, they don't put 
footnotes in executive orders of the President of the United States. No president does that. It is a compliment for them to have taken sentences that you wrote and stick them in an executive order by the President of the United States. It means we can show our donors, the few donors we have, <laughs> that um, we had an influence. So it's a, it's a compliment. And, and I think she realizes politics in Washington is not an academic exercise at all. So those are two examples of where we've influenced it. We've, it's also the case that the people who come say things at these conferences which are very quiet. They would never say them in Washington. In fact, people are shocked at the candor of people because we, we wondered whether we should have these conferences in such a remote place. We think we're the center of the world, but for the rest of the world, they're not quite sure where College Station, Texas is. And the federal officials said, we feel much safer here than we do in Washington. And so please don't move it to Washington. Keep having it here. So we say things to each other we would never say, even in a private meeting in Washington, which I think is very entertaining and also just disturbing when you think about it. So what we're going to do this evening is this. Uh, Dr. Blackburn's going to start. Uh, she has uh, a, a degree, a interdisciplinary degree in veterinary medicine, uh, public health, and political science. So you have three PhDs, is that? Political science communication. And veterinary medicine. Uh, Dr. Jerry Parker, who is one of the national authorities, I, mean, I, I don't say that to exaggerate, he is on so many commissions I've lost count. He is a retired colonel in the United States military in the medical corps, right? Veterinary Corps, excuse me. And he is a veterinarian who went to the veter veterinary school here. And he has a PhD in ph human physiology. So he has two PhDs or whatever you call them. Um, <laughs> and he was the deputy head of USAMRID, which is the US military lab that developed the vaccines that many of us use. I never knew all the vaccines we've taken when we were kids and all. They were developed by the military, some of them 100 years ago. But that lab is very famous, and he was deputy commander of that? And deputy commander. Both. Commander and deputy commander, excuse me. So, and he is also a senior fellow at the Scowcraft Institute and director of the Pandemic Policy Initiative, and he's an associate dean of the veterinary school. But he's on every one of the national commissions. He's called on to testify before Congress. He was a senior civilian after he retired uh, in the uh, executive um, service of the federal government in both HHS and Homeland Security on pandemics. And, and, and DOD, and DOD, thank you. Uh, Glenn Lane, who is a microbiologist, is, was of course, for those of you who know him, a, um, the vice president for research for the university for five years, how many years, five years? And is an expert in infectious disease at all. And he's a professor at the uh, veterinary school as well. He is part of our brain trust. He wasn't actually on the list to speak, but I saw him sitting here and I said, you need to come up here, please. Because <laughs> every, every time I go to a meeting, he's telling me things I don't know, which is easy to do since I don't know that much. Anyway, so uh, Dr. Blackburn, you're gonna begin. Okay. All right, let's see if I can. Get this figured out. Okay, so um, as Professor Nacio said, I'm just gonna cover some of the basics and then uh, pass it along down the line. So uh, coronavirus, I wanted to kind of give everyone an idea who wasn't aware what the coronavirus family is because it's not just this one virus, there's a couple of different viruses. Um, there's four different types of coronaviruses that make up the common cold. So not, not the flu, but just the, the mild cold that you have. And then there's SARS which I'm sure everyone has heard of, and MERS. And then there's this, uh, this new one, the SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so you have the four that are, are kind of very mild, and then you have three that are a little bit more severe. Um, most of the, uh, okay, so coronaviruses are very common in bat species. And it's relatively rare for coronavirus to evolve and to um, jump into humans, but obviously it does happen because we have these seven examples of coronaviruses that have jumped into humans. These are just, so we kinda, I kind of broke it up um, into the things that you need to know uh, about the, this particular virus. The incubation period is two to 14 days, so you do have a bit of a window there. 
the, as far as we can tell, and again, I want to reiterate, th this is what we know right now. So the situation is ongoing, it's constantly evolving, so we don't have all of the details. This is based on what we know at this moment in time. So the reproductive ratio is estimated at 2.23. That just means that for each one person that's infected, they infect about two additional people. Um, there is some evidence that people are contagious before they experience symptoms, and that's very important for how the virus can be spread, because if you don't know that you're sick yet, you're still coming into contact with a lot of people. Um, and the transmission dynamics look a lot more similar to influenza than it does to SARS. So with SARS, for example, your um, viral load, when you're most contagious, it peaked about 10 days after your symptoms started. That's not occurring with this, this particular vi virus, so it's um, looking a lot more like influenza. This is the breakdown of the cases that we have seen so far. So 81% of the cases are mild. 14% are what are considered severe. And then you have 5% of the cases that are, that are critical. Um, and it has a case fatality rate of 2.3%. And I'm going to get into the breakdown of the mortality rates on the next slide, but this is your average case fatality rate. Um, and it does vary by all of these things. So age, health status, gender, um, and the health system is having an in We're seeing that that's having an impact, so that's been very interesting. All right, so this is the breakdown by age. So as you can see, the, the rate is 2.3%, um, but depending on your age, there's a very different mortality rate for you. So people over the age of 80, it's 14.8%. That's very high. Um, and then as you get lower down, it's 0.2%. So the seasonal flu this year is looking at about 0.1%. So when you get to the under 40, it's looking a lot more similar to the seasonal flu, but as you go up in age, you're having increases in mortality rate. Um, lastly, kind of like SARS and MERS, both had gender differences. Mortality rates were higher in men than women. Um, it seems that this coronavirus is looking the same way. So the mortality rate in men is a little over 2%, and in women it's under, it's about 1.7. So we're seeing those similar similarities there too. Um, and I put down on the last one, the among critically ill, it's 49% mortality rate. So your comorbidities, if you have existing diseases, particularly diabetes, um, cardiovascular diseases have been really um, common in severe cases of the virus. So those things do increase the mortality rate. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned that health structures are really important, so they're seeing that places that have more equipped health systems, places with better resources, are having lower mortality rates than places um, with less um, medical infrastructure and resources. Okay, I, we'll take it from here. And I think maybe there's maybe one more administrative uh, thing because we one of our yes, goals is, is to is to allow plenty of time for questions because I'm assuming that uh, many of you will have questions and. And our real goal is not to have a one-way dialogue of information from us to you, but to, but to have a dialogue. And so, so, so we're passing out cards. Please write your questions down and pass them forward, and we'll pick them up. So we, we're passing out cards, index cards. Write your question down and pass them down to the end of your row. And we will pick them up, and I will go through them and read them. And the reason we do that, Frank, there are people who want to give speeches for 10 minutes. <laughs> That's not the purpose of this. And so uh, it, 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 the card is only so big, and it only can fit so many words. <laughs> so uh, write down your questions, and we'll go through them. There is a method to our madness. <laughs> So uh, we're going to go now into really it's a situational update. And this chart here is focusing on the United States. But before I kind of go into the United States, I think the, the global picture is um, there's now over 3,000 deaths uh, worldwide. And probably I haven't looked at the numbers since this morning, but there's probably over 90,000 cases that have been at least reported um, worldwide. And certainly we all know it's been a crisis in China. And there are um, other countries now popping up uh, that, are, that are concerning as, as um, now, and there's travel alerts issued by CDC and the State Department for, uh, in addition to um, China, there's been areas of South Korea, 
Italy and Iran have uh, popped up on our travel three alert um, status. And I'm sure that'll change over the next couple of days. But in regards to the United States, uh, um, certainly there's been a lot of activity over the last week here just in the United States. And we've gone from just uh, about 22 uh, positive cases um, just a few days ago to now we have 96 um, confirmed positive cases in the US. And last night we had two deaths, but this afternoon we have six total deaths in the United States. So the case breakdown of our total um, positive cases includes um, not only case, cases that have been diagnosed here in the United States, but it also includes the, the American citizens, citizens that, were, that were repatriated to the United States from either uh, Wuhan, China, or the Diamond Princess cruise ship. And so um, from the cruise ship, we had 45 uh, cases uh, from that cruise ship that were repatriated to the United States. Um, three uh, cases of other repatriated individuals from Wuhan, China. There are 17 travel-related uh, cases. And now uh, what's got everybody's attention is we have 26 community-confirmed uh, transmission cases. So, so what does that really mean? That means that there's no um, index case of where that person was infected, uh, suggesting that the, that the virus is in these communities and they're picking it up uh, from a non-travel-related uh, individual. And so that, that in itself is, is an indication of perhaps shifting some of our policies and strategies at the national to the local level. So what do those numbers mean? And what is all, oops, oh, thank you, thank you. So as the World Health Organization and the CDC have, have sta said and others that um, the global threat is high. It has been actually for quite some time since this began to get a crisis in, in China and we first began to see some cases outside of China. So the global threat is high. But there's a difference between threat and risk to us and our community. So in China, the risk rem remains high and it's an epidemic crisis in China today. And there's some other countries now that have popped up on that high risk category and that includes South Korea, Italy, Iran, they're at high risk. But the United States, despite this high threat at a global stage, we still remain at low risk of contracting coronavirus in our community. But that could change. It could change rapidly, and so we need to stay alert. But there's that threat. There's a difference between threat and risk, and I think that's an important concept to, to understand as, as, as we have the talking heads talking about this uh, on, a, on almost all day to then now. So what are some of the response actions that have, that have happened then, and that are about to, to happen? Well, the first, at a big level, really the, re, the strategy has been about containment. How can we contain the virus? How we can prevent or at least slow the spread of the virus from China to the United States and other countries? So China actually took uh, pretty unprecedented actions back in January, it was January 23 to be exact, when they locked down Wuhan, and then subsequently a few more days locked down really essentially the entire Hubei province. So that was pretty unprecedented, never been done before, at least in, in modern times. And then um, subsequently, uh, the United States also uh, the administration also implemented some pretty aggressive containment strategies as well on top of really what had already been done with the goal of trying to prevent the spread of virus in the United States. Um, and also with that uh, travel ban, announced with travel ban and travel restrictions, um, we also, for the first time in over 60 years, implemented a federal quarantine order at the federal level, specifically for patients, uh, people that were American citizens being repatriated from high-risk areas in Wuhan, China, and also from the Princess Diamond cruise ship. And so that meant that they were um, needed to be isolated, um, not voluntarily, but um, involuntarily isolated for the 14-day period until they were cleared to be released. And in it, the, what we don't see, but it's happening, there's a lot of people, it's all hands on deck, is our state, local, federal public health, it is all hands on deck because part of that containment strategy is to aggressively try to identify anybody that could be showing symptoms of coronavirus, isolate those um, patients, care for them if needed, 
and then monitor contracts, trace down all the contacts that they may have been in contact with to also monitor those and make sure that they don't have disease. So our, we really need to give a lot of kudos behind the scenes that most of us are not aware of, of our, particularly our local public health authorities and, and the hard work that they are, they are doing been day in and day, day out since this, this began. So again, the purpose of this containment strategy is we've been implemented as a nation up and down to the local level. Again, it's been to slow the spread of the virus in the United States. Um, and also, um, why is that important? If we can slow the spread of the virus, even if we have community outbreaks, uh, hopefully the peaks of those outbreaks will be a lot less severe and will not overwhelm our public health authorities and importantly, our hospitals. So it really is important to slow the spread of the virus down so it, it, it'll, it, it will mitigate the chance and probability of being overwhelmed. It also provides um, time, valuable time to prepare and to begin thinking about our response plans because we actually have pandemic preparedness, pandemic uh, plans that were really begun to develop back in the 2005, 2006 to 2010 timeframe. And we actually exercised those response plans during a real pandemic, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic that most of you remember. So it's not that we don't have plans, we have plans, but those plans now need to be readied. And this containment strategy allows us time to think about those plans and make sure that they are ready um, uh, uh, for whatever contingency we may have. And then also um, it allows time for the medical uh, research enterprise to develop back um, diagnostics, uh, antim uh, antivirals, and, and vaccines. And importantly, as Dr. Blackburn said, there's still a lot we do not know about this virus. And so this is providing us time to better characterize the virus, understand it, and that's very important to guiding the public health response. And so that has been the containment strategy. And so now we are really beginning to, as a nation, uh, at, the, at the federal all the way down to the local level, we are beginning to transition from a purely containment strategy to begin to think about how do we mitigate. So it's containment and mitigation strategies the way we think about the pandemic response, pandemic preparedness and pandemic response. And so we are going to hear more about how communities, hospitals, public health authorities, businesses, schools, universities, Texas A&M, Texas A&M University systems are going to need to um, ready their response plans relook their continuity of business operation plans, and then be prepared to implement social distancing measures if that becomes necessary. And what do I mean by social distancing measures? Well, that could be anything from just avoiding large, uh, large gatherings, public gatherings. But the other end of the spectrum, it could be you know, closing schools. Uh, and then, um, or how, how do you continue to deliver services? while uh, mitigating large people gathering. So, and there's all kind of scenarios built in this, but guess what? Universities, businesses, and schools, and so forth have had to do these plans in the past. And not, I'm not saying they're perfect, uh, but we're not starting from scratch. So you're gonna hear much more about um, the need to ready our, our, our preparedness, continuity of operations plans, and so forth. In fact, um, I was um, in Austin just last week, and Governor Abbott um, made such a statement that across Texas, we need to prepare our, our plans, make sure our plans are, are ready. We also need to prepare for new travel warnings. You know, there are already travel alerts, travel warnings, and, and we need to be ready for, for those. And we have spring break coming up very soon, so that has relevance to, to us here in, in College Station. So what can we do? What do can all of us as individuals? We actually can do a lot. We're, you know, there's a lot we can do and, and control our own destiny. And some of it doesn't sound fancy, and it's not, but it's tried and true public health, infection control, hygiene measures that uh, we can do now, should be doing now, because we actually have a high risk uh, in our communities today, and that's called influenza. But these are very practical things, but they work. Wash hands with soap and water often, 20 seconds. Uh, use alcohol-based hand sanit sanitizers for not only yourself, but wiping down um, um, equipment and, and surfaces. Um, practice and cough and sneeze etiquette. Um, you saw me tonight, I'm using the elbow shake now. And those are the things that we need, need to do, take them serious. And please stay home if you're feeling ill. 
if you think you're, uh, for many reasons, these, these is not new recommendations. But if you're sick and you need health, you need to seek health care guidance, make sure and do so. If you're running a high fever, or you have a cough, you're having shortness of breath, people need to make sure that they call their health care provider before they just show up so your health care provider knows that you're coming in and, and can make sure and make the proper arrangements uh, to receive you as well. So don't just show up, call ahead, but by all means, it, if you think you need to see a health care provider, do so. And in the mostly, most important, actually the WHO has come up with a new term called infodemic with this outbreak. An infodemic is we are having a, um, almost a pandemic of misinformation. It really is becoming a, a, a major issue, a major problem. So make sure that you seek out information from authoritative sources. You know, that may be um, Texas Department of Public Health. It could be the CDC. It could be the World Health Organization. It could be the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs as well. But it's important that you seek out credible and authoritative information. Very, very important. Avoid the infodemic. And I, these, these basic procedures, I, I did this, we need to put some of this in, in context. A lot of people are very, very worried and we're very excited about uh, and concerned and, and worried about COVID-19, but uh, right now in our own communities, it's low risk. But flu is not. Um, and so, you know, just looking at some of the numbers here in the United States, the, and these are estimates, but they're, they're really good estimates. The CDC and others have gotten very good at being able to estimate the influenza burden mathematically coupled with our surveillance uh, network with influenza. So look at flu-related deaths since October of 19 to the present. 18,000 to 46,000 flu-related deaths in the United States. Flu is a major health burden in the United States, and we forget about it, but this is happening in our communities right now. That's why that last slide of taking basic infection control hygiene measures in our, in our homes is so important. In our, in our workplace. You know, flu illnesses, 32 million, 45 million flu illnesses. So influenza is actually very, very serious and is hitting us today. And if your healthcare provider is, is, is recommended a seasonal flu in, in, immunization for you, not everybody is, but most people are recommended. So if, you're, if you should be getting a, a seasonal influenza vaccine, vaccinate, don't hesitate. So moving forward, what are we going to be doing at the kind of the as, as a nation? Uh, what are some of the things that we, we should be doing now as we think forward and, 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 and so forth? So the first thing, as I mentioned, we are going to be transitioning from a containment to a mitigation strategy. We're con we will continue a containment, but we're going to put some emphasis on mitigation that we, we haven't done up until now where we're beginning to see some community-wide uh, uh, community uh, transmission. We, um, we also need at the federal, the state and local level, we need to rapidly expand our diagnostic capability. And you've heard a lot about that, I'm sure, over the, the last um, several days. And so we really need to expand and have point of care diagnostics in our hospitals and our local public health. We need to get beyond having to send everything to the CDC for diagnostics. And we need to ready our preparedness, continuity of operations plans and, and any kind of targeted um, social distance, distancing measures. Our hospitals do need to be prepared. Our hospitals do need to prepare to receive a surge in critical, or be able to handle a, a surge in critical care patients. You know, just because uh, the statistics that Dr. Blackburn, you know, saw, saw showed is, although 81% from the study that we're, we're referencing, that's it's a peer-reviewed study that um, is in the Journal of American Medical Association. It is from China, uh, but it has been peer reviewed and it's the largest cohort that's been an analyzed this way. So even though 81% are mild cases, there's still 5% are, that are critical, requiring intensive critical care. And so that, that number actually kind of worries me more than anything else is that, that number of cases that could end up being critical, critical care. And although we also say mild, I know when I get a cold, I don't feel too good. And I happen to fall into uh, to, uh, that category of over 60. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you, you, to, you have to, you know, make sure and kind of watch that if you have, have a cold and make sure it doesn't progress into pneumonia. Um, 
And most importantly, we have to provide, we have, our health care providers have to be protected. And so protect, uh, personal protective equipment, infection control is going to be very, very important in our hospital and health care settings. We have to surge our research and development in, engine here in the United States and globally, and it is. Uh, we have to, and, and there's unbelievable, uh, unprecedented surge in the scientific enterprise right now to try to um, uh, develop new vaccines, antivirals, diagnostics, and so forth, and just the information uh, to better characterize this, this virus. It's, an, um, it's just unprecedented, the, the surge in our R&D uh, enterprise. We have to be better at risk communications. We just have to be better at risk communications. This is one of the hardest of the hardest infectious diseases. It's a very complex topic, and, and we um, lessons observed since the anthrax letter attacks, the SARS, to the influenza, to the Ebola. We just have not done a good job. It's been a lessons ob observed and not turned into a lesson learned on how to do a good job at risk communication. We have to tell people to prepare, and, but not panic. Um, we also then, uh, supply chain is going to become a major issue. We have to prepare for supply chain disruptions, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. And we have to avoid uh, complacency during this event, but after this crisis is over. We've been banging the drum, so to speak, in our work at the Skullcroft Institute that pandemic preparedness is, is, is critical. And as a nation, we need to be putting much more emphasis between outbreaks. That's when we can really make a change is, is work on this between outbreaks so we can be ready, in fact, prevent an outbreak anywhere from becoming a major pandemic. So, final slide and I will stop. Um, should we be concerned? Um, again, I've said this already, you know, the risk to you and I today and our community uh, remains low. Um, but the, that could change and we need to, to pay attention. We should expect to see more cases uh, in our community across the United States, and we should expect to see community transmission. And we should be, we should expect it in our own community as well. I hope it doesn't happen, but we just, um, we should be ready for it if it, if it does. So, so please stay alert, pay attention to your local public health authorities. That really is the, the, the ones that will be tuned in to what's happening in, in our community. They're, they're really the best source of information across the United States in any given community. If this becomes worse in the United States, it's not going to hit every community at the same time. It's going to hit individual communities throughout a given period. So stay tuned, stay, stay, stay in touch with your local public health communities. And again, you know, most cases are mild, um, but you know, statistics are t statistics, and if you end up being one of the severe or critical care, you know, statistics are kind of meaningless. But um, so be alert. My, my final message is be alert not anxious, prepare, do not panic. And so with that, I think um, um, actually, Dr. Lane, would you mind, because I know we have, um, we are standing up a task force at Texas A&M to look at some of the things that how we can better contribute, you know, across the, um, the uh, particularly the research and development enterprise, and we have some new um, capacities and capabilities at, at Texas A&M that have been on the books for quite some time, and we're kind of pivoting those things into this. So do you mind saying just a few okay, words before we, before we uh, do, do the question? So uh, I'll be brief and uh, maybe uh, two points. For those of us who tend to fret about things, we tend to fret about uh, a, a potential, say, a chemical spill or a, uh, a, a nuclear event uh, releasing some radioactive material. And, uh, but those are really contained events, okay? The issue with uh, biological events, events is that they're self-perpetuating, okay? So uh, the, uh, and some of this is gonna be like uh, the commercial general obvious, but uh, so the best way to, uh, uh, you know, maintain a healthy environment is not to get contaminated, okay? Don't get infected. It seems intuitive, but, but that's the path to take. Uh, in the United States, we have probably the best uh, infection control protocols in the world, uh, particularly in our health care uh, facilities. But uh, just in general, the general health here, you go to uh, uh, a restaurant or a store, sometimes you'll see the uh, alcohol hand uh, rubs and, and, and whatever. 
And uh, if you practice those, uh, as uh, Dr. Parker said, watch your coughing, keep your distance, when you're sick, stay home. Uh, we, uh, these things will, will be the ultimate um, tool that uh, prevents things from getting out of hand. I will bring up that uh, we have tremendous capacities here at Texas A&M University, not only for uh, vaccine development, but we have a, a brand new $100 million facility that uh, just opened its doors, the uh, Global Health uh, Research um, uh, Facility. And uh, I see Dr. Adams sitting over here. He was spearheaded this. And, uh, and uh, in that facility, we will work with uh, uh, highly uh, contagious diseases and uh, uh, Things that uh, I don't want to say or would be much worse than a coronavirus, but, but they are. And, and uh, we have that under control. And so if we can control things that, uh, I mean, there are places in the world where things are really going poorly. And you, you've seen the Ebola uh, outbreak in Africa. And it's not like that here. You know, we have a path forward, and uh, if we maintain our public health policies and, and uh, you know, good infection control, we'll be just fine. But um, I want to say one other issue, and it has to do with uh, wearing masks, okay? So there's a lot of misinformation about what masks might or might not be capable of doing, uh, and, and people have said that, well, masks don't work. Well, that's actually not true. The masks work but uh, you shouldn't be wearing them if you don't need them, okay? There are people who need them, and they're the people in the facilities that are actually treating uh, patients who, who have the coronavirus. So uh, if we'll lighten up a little bit uh, on the purchasing of masks for our personal use, let the people who are actually dealing with the disease uh, have the masks so that people get good care, and this is... Uh, you know, also, my opinion, but I'm getting this from the uh, Surgeon General, who has been, you know, frantically staying, saying, "Cut it out! You know, quit, quit buying the masks." There are people who actually need them. So I'm going to turn this back over. And okay. there are several questions here that I can answer fairly quickly. Uh, some of them are a little political, so I will handle them. Was it a mistake to appoint Vice President Pence as the Pass Force leader? <laughs> okay. We recommended in our first paper when President Obama was still in office that the vice president, whoever the vice president is, should always be chosen to head the White House task force in any pandemic. And what's the reason for that? This is not a scientific question. We do not want a scientist running this. No offense to scientists, okay? You want a person in senior office who has authority to order cabinet secretaries to do things that their agencies may not want to do. Other cabinet secretaries cannot do that. Alex Azar, is an, in my view, is an excellent secretary of HHS. He's a medical doctor. He's very competent. Jerry knows him well. But he's, he cannot tell. He can urge them to do something. He can encourage them. He can't order them to. The president is too busy, no matter who the president is, with other stuff. The vice president is the person who should, and there's, there's a task force on biosecurity that Jerry's part of that's headed by Senator, former majority leader in the Senate, a Democrat, uh, to, uh, Tom Das. Uh, uh, Senator Lieberman uh, and Tom, uh, Tom Ridge. Tom Ridge and Senator Lieberman, um, a Democrat and Republican. They recommended the same thing. We recommended it in our, and we repeated that again after Trump was elected. He chose initially to appoint Alex Azar. We know why, but um, now it's become critical. We need to have the vice president who can order cabinet secretaries to do things, to cooperate with each other, because they do not always cooperate. I can tell you from personal True. experience, from, and so can Jerry. True. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll um, add a flavor to that. Actually, uh, uh, Alex Azar made a quote a, a day after uh, the vice president was uh, uh, put in this position, and, and um, Alex's quote was, the vice president has the biggest stick. That's why we need it. Exactly, exactly. Um, the second is how has, has Iran handled this? The, the initial death rate was 25% in Iran, which means either they have a new variety of this virus or the local authorities and hospitals are not reporting all the cases because they're afraid of what's going to happen to them uh, if they give bad news, or the central government could be suppressing the information. But the notion that the death rate is 25 is nonsense. 
So what's very clear is that Iran is worried. They're already under severe stress internally, but this could be uh, an event that could have severe political implications internally. So I suspect that, that either lower level uh, functionaries or medical staff that are afraid politically or the senior leadership are suppressing the information about how th bad things are. They're clearly bad given the rates that they're getting, they're, they're, they're publicizing because they have no, they have no um, relevance to what the, the scientific studies show the, the rates of uh, mortality rates are. Uh, someone asked the question of whether, how does this compare to the flu? And, and Jerry put some statistics up here, but let me explain it in a different way. The coronavirus is 20 times more dangerous in terms of mortality rates than the flu is. So that it's a tenth of 1% of the people who get the flu die. It's 2.5%, so it's actually 25 times more deadly than the flu is. So that's the bad news. The good news is the flu is three times more um, dangerous in terms of, of uh, spreading. It, it, the R -not, it's called the r naught factor. r naught is the way in which, and Christy explained it using different language, uh, is the ratio of the people to how many other people they infect. The flu is, averages six or seven people. The one person who gets the flu will infect six or seven people. The infection rate for uh, the coronavirus is about 2 to 2.3. So the, the flu is three times more infectious than the coronavirus is. That's, that's the good news because it means fewer people are going to get it. So comparing to the flu, it's not easily comparable because of these two uh, statistics that uh, prevent, pr present different levels of risk. Um, there is another question you asked about um, respiratory about um, whether this will decline as it gets warmer. Because the initial reports were from scientists that said MERS and SARS uh, and, and colds get less severe in the summertime because the, the virus likes dry, cold weather, not warm, humid weather. We do not know that that's the case with this. In fact, some scientists are saying now that is not going to be the case. So we are not going to get relief because the summer comes, particularly in Texas. So don't assume that the summer time will come and this will just disappear. Someone also asked, is this, could this become a chronic disease that we have a problem with every year? And the answer is yes, it could. It hasn't happened yet. We don't know, but it could happen. Okay. Um, vaccine, where we are. Jerry, why don't you talk about vaccine development, where we are on that? Yeah, the vaccine development, in fact, the WHO just um, discussed uh, this, this week that there's at least over 20 companies or academics that are, have a um, vaccine development, accelerated vaccine development to discover a, a vaccine candidate. And so it's amazing um, with the, um, the uh, spread which, which our scientific um, um, engine is uh, discovering and actually readying a vaccine that could be then go into clinical trials. A couple in the United States that are supported by the, the NIH. Um, I, I'm going to stay away from company names, but they're you know, all based on um, new vaccine you know, platform technology and so forth. There should be the first vaccine in the United States that will enter clinical trials by, um, by the end of March before April 1st. Um, but that's just the start. And so, you know, I think that, you know, we, we shouldn't expect, anticipate, uh, you know, even though something is going to be ready in three months to go in clinical trials, you should still expect at least 18 months before there may be something that's actually ready because vaccine clinical trials, they're there for a reason. They're not uh, necessarily in regulatory impediments. We want to make sure that if we do use a vaccine on a population-wide scale, that it doesn't do harm, um, because that's happened too, and that it, um, it can be effective. And so phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials take time. I suspect that if we are still in a, in a kind of a crisis situation, that uh, a vaccine access could, um, under emergency use authorization, 
could start to perhaps be become more available in certain situations, maybe to high risk populations like uh, healthcare providers, sometime in a in a, a phase two B type clinical trial situation. But uh, well, I guess what I'm trying to say, uh, on the one hand, it's um, been unprecedented the speed that we're uh, applying vaccine platform technologies uh, today that have not been in our toolkit in the past. But they still are going to have to go through some rigorous testing. And then scale up manufacturing takes, takes uh, an effort as, as well. So it's unprecedented, but there's some things that are just, there's only so fast you can go with some of the, some of the things. But I know the FDA is doing everything they can to try to streamline the, the, the re regulatory um, requirements and so forth to, to ch change the risk benefit analysis. As an, uh, today, the administration had many of the um, major pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, manufacturer CEOs in the White House uh, to elicit their support and uh, to move out um, briskly as well with industry. So this is this is going to be a major major push uh, by by industry uh, and, and our government to speed things up as much as we humanly can. But it will take time. Uh, someone asked uh, w to compare this virus to the 1918 influenza. The 1918 fluen influenza virus was the worst event of the 20th century in terms of mortality. More people died than died in World War I and World War II. Half of the U.S. casualties in World War I were from the influenza sweeping through the trenches in, uh, in the war. Half of our soldiers who died, died from the influenza. Um, five, at the upper end of the calculations, because some of the calculations now are that 50 to 90 million people died within six months in 1918 of the influenza. Uh, the, so 5% of the world's population died in six months. That's really difficult to imagine, but it did happen. It, uh, unusually, it attacked younger people which is not the case now. Young, the long, younger you get, the, the more protected you are to this virus. In fact, there's no, there's no reporting of any child under the age of nine dying from the coronavirus. For some reason, they seem to be very resistant to it. The younger you are, the more resistant you are, uh, which is good news. From I'm a grandfather, so <laughs> particularly interested in that. Um, the, the other thing about the flu in 1918 is the, a war was going, a huge war, World War I, and people were moving all over the world, troops were moving. That spread the virus much more rapidly. And because of the war, the uh, Wilson, President Wilson's uh, committee that was developing the communication systems did not want to alert the public about the pandemic. And there's a book called The Great Influenza by John Barry in which he goes into some detail in chapters and how disastrous that was. That is not the case now, but it was then. That made things much worse. He does say in the book that in those communities where the community leadership steps up to, to provide leadership, uh, in Philadelphia they did it, in a whole bunch of other cities they did not do it. The cities where the leadership of the city, mayor or not, uh, it could be the business community, it could be the political figures. If they step up to lead, the sense of panic declines, and there's an orderly system for dealing with it. In the cities where there was no leadership, it was a catastrophe. So leadership counts, particularly at the local level uh, in our municipalities, our cities in Texas, our counties, and townships around the country. Um, there's a question here about international travel. Christy, you quoted a, a study to me the other day that tested, I don't know if it was for this or another virus, about the risk of getting uh, infected by someone from this particular virus on a plane. So influenza. That's influenza. Okay, why don't you tell us what that report was? Even though it's not this, it, 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 actually the influenza is three times more uh, uh, infectious. So tell, tell us what the, the study showed. Uh, sure. There's there's a couple of studies that tries to look at how if you're sitting on an airplane and you have one infected person, like how many other people on the plane get infected. And so generally the consensus is anyone within two rows of the infected person has the highest rate of becoming infected. Um, and everyone else on the plane is relatively safe. So your um, chances of becoming infected drop dramatically the farther away you are from that. 
from that person. So within a meter, you're, that's when you're most likely to be infected. So, so if you're on a plane and the person right next to you is sweating profusely, coughing, and has muscle ache, you might want to go to the men's room and the ladies' room for the rest of the trip. I'm, <laughs> I'm only, I'm, I'm not joking, this is not dark humor here. Uh, that, that, you're at risk, but the other people on the plane, uh, as Christy just said, are, are probably not at risk. And that's for the influenza, which is much more contagious than this Pretty is. Right. So it says here, do you have suggestions for travel plans? Don't go to Italy right now. I think that's not a good idea uh, because the, it is uh, moving very rapidly. In the, the other countries in Europe, it doesn't appear to be moving very rapidly yet. Right? Is that fair well, to say, Jerry? Or well, yeah, let me just add uh, another, and it's, this is just anecdote. Uh, uh, this is just an anecdote, and um, I'm also hearing that just travel connections, there's a lot of flights being canceled, so international travel, whether you're going to a high-risk country or, or a country on even a level one or level two list, just going through and the connections and so forth, a lot of flights are being canceled, so just getting somewhere and getting home is becoming challenging, whether you're going to a high-risk country or not. So you have to take into account, um, in addition to those, what country is how you get there and all the logistics that are, uh, people are beginning to suffer now. So the question here is how long can COVID-19 survive outside the host uh, on a surface, let's say? Um, and I think it's four or five days on average. You know, I'm going to have to say we don't know for sure, but yeah, you know, four to five days on average. But you know, the, there is a study, some studies that say it could be up to nine days. But I think they are saying four to five. You know, day could be. But so it's one of these kind of questions we don't have the hard data yet. Right. You would normally think an RNA virus is not going to survive that long. Um, probably most of them don't. But there is some data that says it could be up to nine days, and so. It's one of these you know, pieces of data we have to really understand better. Uh, Jerry, could you answer this next question? There is a patient who was released prematurely from Lockhart Air Force Base. <laughs> could you, uh, we had a discussion. In San Antonio? In San Antonio. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, maybe the best thing is um, once we leave here tonight, probably you know, I, I, I will um, point you toward the San Antonio Express news and you can kind of get the latest update on that. But apparently there was a, one of the repatriated U U.S. citizens was released over the weekend, had already been tested uh, once, had a presumptive. For, the protocol is you need to have two consecutive negative tests with both a nasopharyngeal and a throat swab. So that's four tests, two of them 24 hours apart. So that's four total tests, both of the, all that negative, and then you could be released. Well, there was one, one patient that um, apparently um, had a, had a, was released before one of the second tests came back, and so that's causing a lot of issues. So anyway, I don't know all the details, and I, I, would, I would point you toward uh, the, the news in San Antonio, Texas, to, to get the latest, but you, you will see news about that this evening for sure. I do want to introduce Dr. Dennis Carroll, who's sitting here quietly. Uh, Dr. Carroll is one of the senior health officers in USAID, our foreign aid agency. I ran AID for five years under President Bush 43, and I appointed Dennis to head the uh, task force and the influenza or the flu when we were afraid of a repetition of 1918. President Bush was read. Uh, the, the, uh, John Barry's book, and he got very upset. He also ordered copies of the book sent to all of us, we had to read it. The entire cabinet and sub-cabinet had to read the book. <laughs> and I put Dennis in charge, and Dennis is doing what Christy and Glenn and uh, Jerry do to me every day, which is to give me briefing, constantly telling me, answering all my questions. Dennis just retired from AID, and he's going to be speaking tomorrow about health issues generally. Uh, he'll be speaking at the PCC. Lauren, where are you? What time is it? Six o'clock tomorrow evening, so you're invited. He, I'm sure you're gonna get questions, Dennis, about the coronavirus, but you're gonna talk more broadly. We have been worried about a repetition of 1918. This is not it, but this is a good, situ a, a good test run for us to get ready, because we're not ready. Even the advanced democracies, even though we have planning and all that, there are still a bunch of things that need to be dealt with. We haven't, and I might add, the best way to stop a pandemic is at the source, not trying to con control it at the border. It's too late. It's too late at the border. And, there's, and particularly with something like avian flu, bird flu, you're going to 
you know, stop three billion uh, uh, birds flying over the United States from South America to Siberia, every, which goes on every year. You can't do that. So uh, the reality is you stop it where it is. And so I just written an article for the Washington Times. They invited me to write it saying, the last thing on earth we should be doing is cutting our foreign aid program now because there are AID health programs. A third of the entire aid budget, $10 billion, uh, is spent on health. We should not be cutting it. There's also a proposed 50% cut in the budget for the World Health Organization. That is a terrible idea right now. Whatever you think of WHO, they have weaknesses. And the reality is we need an international institution to coordinate information and to give guidance. And there are a lot of good scientists there. I think it's dysfunctional managerial, but that's a different matter. That's been going on for years. It has nothing to do with the staff. It has to do how we set the agency up 50 or 60 years ago. That's a different matter. So um, there are things we should be doing to strengthen the developing world to respond to the, this pandemic. The notion that we're going to abandon our friends in Latin America or, or the Middle East or Africa uh, is nonsense. It doesn't make any sense, and it's not protecting us. So that's uh, one of the questions was on that. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Morano. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Dr. Blackburn mentioned diabetes, increased risk of mortality. Why? Does this include both type, type 1 and type 2? If yes, which one is the higher risk? <laughs> Do you know that? No, I don't. It doesn't, it just says diabetes increases your chances. Um, and it, like we t have talked about many times, we don't really have all the information. There's really not an answer yet as to why, but hopefully, or which one, um, but hopefully as the outbreak goes on and we gain more information, that'll, we'll have that. Uh, someone has asked, several people have asked about the data coming out of China. The peer-reviewed study is one thing. A dictatorship in China is a dictatorship, not a totalitarian dictatorship because there are a whole bunch of Chinese scientists and uh, 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 medical doctors who put themselves at risk by speaking out. In a totalitarian like North Korea, that would never happen. You'd be executed on the spot. So China is a dictatorship, it is not a totalitarian dictatorship, thank heaven. I don't trust the data coming out of the China. The notion there are 90,000 people, I think, is nonsense. There are several models that have been done, one at uh, Oxford, that say the actual infection rate, based on the r naught factor that we know of now, is 40 times higher than what is being reported in China. 40 times higher. So that would mean about 3 million people have it, not 70 or 80,000. The, the, the total number worldwide is now up to 90,000, I believe, but they say in China it's like 78,000. I don't believe it at all, and the, uh, the studies show, the modeling shows that at that R-naught factor, the, it should be much higher. It, the, also, the other problem is that they're reporting on, on deaths, on mortality in China. The Wall Street Journal ran an article from someone in China before there was a clampdown in all of the reporting in which they went in and looked at the death certificate of people who had died in Wuhan. And the people were being reported as dying from a heart attack or stroke, but they actually died from the, pan the, uh, the uh, virus. coronavirus. And the rule in China is you die, you, you, if you die, you take the first comorbidity, that is to say the first disease that, you're, that you contracted, <clears throat> and report that as the cause of death. So the, it was, it's clear from the way in which the reporting was being done in China early on that they were, not by order of the central government, but the way in which they were doing the reporting, they were reporting the, the first illness they had, not the coronavirus, which was their immediate cause of death. So I don't I trust either the mortality rates or the infection rates in China, because this is, un, this is uh, destabilizing the government, which in China is, a, you know, it's, it's not easy to destabilize the Chinese government. It is being destabilized. You can tell on the internet now, the things people are saying in public, openly, are, have never, we've never seen this since the Tiananmen Square uprising in uh, 1989, 1989. So the Chinese leadership, I think, are under severe stress now, and they're very nervous that there's going to be a popular uprising, and, and uh, I think we should watch that. But uh, democracies do much better at mobilizing the public through the political system because we have so many levels of government. We have 87,000 units of local government and county government in the United States. That's who we're relying on, actually. 
not the national government. We're relying on our local officials and our state officials. Okay, um, let's see what else is there here. You mentioned the, um, how is the media reporting on ant possible human to animal transmission? Do we get animals sick? And can animals get us sick, other than the bats in China? I know you're gonna get tired of this answer, but there's still a lot we don't know. But there have been some recent reports of, of um, in, in, actually out of Hong Kong, with uh, companion animals, dog uh, testing positive, or at least weekly positive. And so what does that mean? I don't know, you know, because some of these tests, even in humans, or we have false positive, false negatives with, with the test. Um, but so far, what we know about how this started, uh, the presumptive host is the bat uh, species. There's more than likely an intermediate host that we don't know that's under uh, active investigation to try to determine what the intermediate uh, host animal is. Um, but I think it's something that we're going to have to actually, you know, follow this very closely. And I know all of us who um, have companion animals at home are going to want to know what to do. And so we're going to have to follow this, this science and understand it better. Um, but I guess it wouldn't surprise me to see a, a human okay. to animal um, type transmission in something like this. But it's one of those things that's going to require more um, science investigation. Christy, do you want to answer that one? And it's probably, that was probably a, just a, a single event. I, 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 uh, this is something you just do not need to get worried about, but we need to kind of stay uh, attuned to it. Um, so there's a question about whether there's a travel ban to Mexico during spring break, and also if there's a period of isolation for people who are returning to the country from travel. Um, so I have, have been following some of the discussion about what's going on with possible restrictions to Mexico and from um, what I've seen, there's nothing in, well, from what I read earlier today, it could have changed, I guess, in the last couple hours, but uh, there is no travel ban to or from Mexico. So there has been mention of potential restrictions, travel restrictions, um, but the Mexican government is saying there ha and ha is saying there hasn't been any conversation about that at an international level. So. As of right now, no. You can still go to Mexico for spring break if you want well, to. What I would say, students and faculty, you need to be paying attention because there, there will be some, there, actually there was some guidance from Texas A&M that went out, I believe, Friday on just travel ad advisory. And there will probably be more that will be coming out for the whole system. So just please pay attention to the, um, to the administration um, at our university as, as travel uh, guidance will be coming out and uh, take it seriously. Um, and, but right now, there's, there's only, let's see, it's, it's China, it's South Korea, it's um, Iran, it is some parts of Italy that are at this um, kind of the high, higher level. Um, and so, but it, it, the, these things will change. And I think also uh, take into consideration just the logistics of international air travel. So it's going to probably be just tough and hard. Uh, over the just because of the flight flight cancellation, so you just need to take all that in, into account as you think about your own I international um, travel. But please listen to the guidance that's going to be coming out. There'll be guidance about um, you know coming back from some countries. If you're coming back from a high risk country, you're probably going to need to do some self isolation and be, be monitored. Um, so this one says, what do you advise for people who have been to Seattle and have come home and now have flu symptoms? Um, what we talked about before, call your health care provider and make sure you call first so that you're not, in case you do have coronavirus, you're not showing up into the waiting room um, and so they'll be prepared for you when you get there. Um. Uh, one, you asked about, someone asked about the A&M use of the tobacco labs. <clears throat> I remember when President Bush was briefed on the risk of a flu uh, a repetition of 1918, he said, so how fast can we produce vaccines? maximum. And I, the figure I remember is 22 million uh, doses we can produce. And he said, you can't be serious. He said, so I'm going to be president while we have 1918 and we only can produce 28 million, or 22 million uh, uh, doses. Now, I don't know if it was 28 million or something like, but it was not the amount we needed to protect the country. And so what's happened since then 
is the, uh, I think President Bush and then President uh, Obama got through legislation or uh, appropriations built to build, I think it's four large, vac is it four, three or four? Four. Four very big, one of them is here. And they can produce 40 or 50 million vaccines in three months if there's a national emergency. They're privately owned now, but BARDA, which is part of HHS, funded them, and they can take them over if there's a national emergency. The one thing that this may do is cure the whole movement, uh, anti-vaccine movement, because <laughs> it is not helpful. Oh, the Russians, by the way, a lot, they did a study at GW of who's sourcing a lot of this. The Russians are behind a lot of the anti-vaccine messaging that's on the internet. And they, they're on both sides. 50% of the message is pro-vaccine, 50% is pro-anti-vaccine. Uh, and I asked a, a Soviet, a Russian scholar, a scholar of Russia, I said, why are they doing that? They said, to create epistemological chaos. I said, what does that mean? They said, well, it means that the Russians want chaos, so we don't, none of us really know what to do. And, and they're doing it deliberately. It's not an accident, it's from the government, they're one of the cyber ministry, warfare ministries that they have. So it's not helpful. Uh, I understand why people are concerned. They wanna make sure their children are not put at, or they're not put at risk, but vaccines are not Unless you have some kind of an allergy to eggs or something like that, you're not at risk. And if you don't get it, you are definitely at risk. So I, I'm hoping that this will reverse the trend against vaccinations because it's, it's a very dangerous trend. Could, could, I, could I add something yes. kind of the back? Because I think one thing is going to be it. with COVID, uh, we're certainly going to have a major um, vaccine research and development um, effort. But I think what's going to be turning out to be most useful in the very short term is going to be the antivirals and having something uh, for, for, for treatment. So I think we're going to see a strategy, a two-pronged approach uh, to accelerate because there are actually already some already approved antivirals that, that are showing some efficacy and, and um, kind of compassionate use. So I think we're going to see a big effort in antivirals while the vaccine research and development um, arm also uh, uh, moves along. Someone asked, and this will be the last question we're going to answer because we're supposed to have ended at 6.30, uh, how the federal government has done on this. One of the things Alex Azar did that no one even, I mean, we noticed it immediately. He issued, a, he signed an order under the Pandemics and All Hazards Act, creating or putting a coronavirus on the list of Food and Drug Administration emergency procurement and, and research uh, 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 viruses or, or diseases. What that means is there is an expedited, dramatically expedited process for vaccines and medications if you're on that list. You, you, they, they, don't, they don't compromise our safety, but they, they don't go through the normal bureaucratic process. That was one of the first things he did, and it was a, it was a, a switch. There's a whole bunch of legal switches that go on once you do that, and so the federal government has done some very important things no one even knows about them. There are, is a large number of very skilled senior uh, medical professionals in the federal government. Dennis Carroll is certainly one of them. Tony Fauci, you've seen him on the air. I know Tony very well. We worked in the HIV AIDS program of President Bush, the malaria program of President Bush. He is one of the authorities in the country on infectious disease. In the world. In the world, in the world. Everyone asks for advice. And he said he was not being pushed uh, I would say for everybody, this is my last comment, on both sides of the aisle, both sides of the aisle, and both liberals, conservatives, and the few moderates left in the United States, <laughs> that we should measure our words. Public officials should measure their words. They don't have to measure in everything, just in terms of this virus. Don't scare people. Don't say things unless you're sure of it, unless there's empirical research and don't use exaggerated language. We don't need that in this area. We don't need it at all, but we certainly don't need it now. We don't want to scare the public or panic them, but we need to be candid with them what the risks are. So measured language is very important for all our political figures appointed and elected. I might add, I've listened to President, Vice President um, uh, Pence, and he's using the word, he keeps saying it to people getting carried away with stuff, saying things they shouldn't say. Uh, he said, we're all in this together. 
If you think the virus is going to exempt you because you're a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal, you're living in a fantasy world. I'm sure you all know that. So his comment over and over again is we're all in this together. We need to unite as a country. There's a crisis. We need to do it the way Americans did during World War II. I'm not saying it's that bad, but it, 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 that's the right message. That's the right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.